Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Reverend Bynum, for welcoming me here, and Linda Cooper Stocks for the invitation. And thank you, Representative Butterfield. I live in Durham, but I live in his district. He is my representative. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. And thank you for those incredible stories. I feel energized and inspired and humbled just to be in this place and to know a little more about the history here. So thank you. I'll be very brief. I first want to also thank my campaign manager, Caroline Spencer. Caroline, raise your hand. She uh, is a Wilson lady. Um, she is leading me on this journey. I do everything she tells me to do. <laughs> Even when it involves standing out front of dicks, waving. <laughs> um, so I, I promise I'll be very brief, but I want to share with you a little bit about some of my heroes in, in the civil rights movement and how they refuse to stay silent. Because I think the silence is not an option, is exactly the right message for our time. And I have to start with my father. My father was black, my mother was white. And when they um, first got together in the state of Missouri, it was illegal for them to be married there. And so they moved to Washington State, which is where I grew up. But before they met, back in the 40s, my father wanted to be a barber. And um, at that time, he needed a license. He wanted to take the exam in order to be licensed to become a barber. Um, and I have to say, he was the smartest man I've ever met, but when he was growing up, there was also was no four-year institution in the state of Missouri that would admit African Americans, so he did not have the opportunity to get the kind of education that I believe would have allowed him to realize his full potential. But he um, wanted to do what he could, and the, um, in its wisdom, the state of Missouri said that he could not take the barber's license because that would involve him sitting in a room with white people. So he hired an attorney, and um, I think this happened so many times in so many places. There wasn't a class action lawsuit. He didn't take on the state of Missouri. His attorney negotiated a settlement. He was able to take the barber's license sitting in his car outside the examination. <laughs> he got his license. He made a living as a barber, as a bowler. Sometimes he was a taxi driver. He boxed. Ultimately, he taught himself. Um, how to be an orderly in a hospital. He got on-the-job training, and he eventually became a urological technician and taught interns um, at the University of Washington Hospital. So he, he did all the things. Uh, he, he broke through barriers. Um, he refused to stay silent when he wanted to uh, access opportunities, and he was an inspir inspiration to me as the first one in my family to be able to access education to believe that as a lawyer, I could make a difference and try to break down barriers. Now, I, I want to tell you about one of my clients, but before I do, I, I want to share um, a story about why I continue to do this work, because that's how I got started 30 years ago. But 12 years ago, I faced a challenge um, that I didn't ever expect. Um, my brother, who is two years younger than me, uh, looks darker than I do, looks more black, um, he, he faced a circumstance where um, I, I was at the Center for Civil Rights at the time, and I got a call from my father, very distraught. Um, and what had happened was our neighbor had come over with a newspaper article and said, here's this story about this man who's been killed. Isn't that your son? And it was my brother. He had been killed about two and a half days ago. Um, he'd been killed by someone who was living with him. They told the police who my father was, contact him, but apparently it wasn't very high on their priorities. And that began to give me an inkling um, of what I might face. But I, by this point, I had been an attorney in Washington, D.C., at the Justice Department. I had prosecuted uh, police misconduct cases. I knew what it takes to prove a case of murder. I knew the different levels of, 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 of um, criminality. And I investigated, I went to the police and the district attorney. I vowed to my family that I would get justice for my brother's murder, but I was not able to. There were two reasons given to me, neither of which I think is satisfactory. The first one was that this is really expensive. We're a rural county, we really can't afford to bring a murder charge. Um, the person who killed him was arrested initially, but they released her. The second reason I was given was 
that no jury in that county would convict a white woman of killing a black man. And so faced with that, I really had to ask myself, um, what does it mean that I'm a warrior? What does it mean that I believe in justice, that I've been fighting for justice, if I can't even get justice for my own family? And ultimately, what I concluded was that I can't stop. I can't um, sit down. Silence is still not an option for me. And so I have continued to do this work. But when you hear people tell you that Anita is soft on crime, I want you to know that I understand what it means in a very personal way when the justice system doesn't work for our communities. And I want you to know about, that me, about me because I know I'll be under attack in a lot of different ways over the next year. Let me tell you a different story about one of my clients, Alberta Curry, in the voter ID case. And I think this is important because these issues are going to come up again. Alberta Curry was born on a, her family's farm. Um, she was, uh, was the daughter of sharecroppers. She picked cotton, picked tobacco. Um, but she was born at home with a midwife and did not have a birth certificate. And in 1956, which was the first year that she was able to vote, um, in Robinson County, where she lived at the time, uh, the practice was that when whites came in to vote, they went to the head of the line. So if you were black in that county, you kind of wanted to get to the polling place early in the day with your lunch and hope that you might be able to vote by the end of the day. So for her and her family, voting in person and being the first person in line on election day was really a matter of personal pride and personal dignity. She wanted to be able to say, when I stand up and go to that polling place and cast my ballot, my ballot counts the same as every other voter in my county. That's what matters to me. But when it came to the legislature passing a voter ID requirement, she couldn't get a driver's license. She tried. She spent about $150 going to DMV repeatedly, but she didn't have a birth certificate. She couldn't get an ID. Um, and ultimately, so she was the lead plaintiff in our case. She had the courage to stand up and say, this is my experience. Most of you have IDs. Most of you fly. Most of you are able to vote. It's, you don't, it, it's not a problem for you. But for some of us, for some 8 to 10 percent of the population, it is an absolute bar. And, and so um, the lead we sued. The General Assembly, in a pattern that's happened repeatedly in history, slightly changed the law to try to get out from under our lawsuit. They said, OK, well, you can go through this reasonable impediments process. So in March of 2014, when that was in place, uh, Ms. Curry went to her polling place on election day and said, I don't have an ID, um, but I'm here to vote. They didn't offer her a reasonable impediments ballot. Um, they turned her away and said, sorry, you can't vote here today. So she called us, and we had to send a lawyer down to go with her to her polling place. Um, and they showed up. Polling official said, sorry, you can't vote. The lawyer said, wait a minute. I've got the statue right here, yes. And ultimately, after you know, 30, 40 minutes, she's able to vote. That's in March of 2014. Mm -hmm. so, so I tell you, when, what do we face now? Um, First, I just have to say we face overt and explicit endorsement of racist ideology at the highest level of our governments, and silence is not an option in the face of that. But beyond that, you know, all of that is going on, but there's also a lot going on um, almost behind, below the radar screen. The um, powers that be in Raleigh are restructuring our political process, just as they made those elections at large in the past. They're now changing how our elections are going to happen to try to dilute, weaken your, your voting strength. So things like voter ID, they're talking about a constitutional amendment on your ballot in May to reinstate a voter ID requirement. Um, and they're promoting this as saying 70 to 80 percent of the voters agree to it. And I tell you, I don't care if 99 percent of the voters agree to it, you can't vote away somebody's constitutional <coughs> rights. Right? Hmm. And our state constitution guarantees the right to vote for everyone who's 18, a citizen, and a resident. So that may come up. We're also going to see a redrawing of our trial court uh, judicial districts in a way that pits African Americans together in a district. Um, we are, and in a way that makes it harder for the, the voting strength of, of black voters to count in the process. We have seen at the appellate court level, they've made the office a partisan office, but eliminated the primary. 
with, with the goal of having a bunch of um, people from one party on the ballot to split the voting strength. Um, and they're also talking about a constitutional amendment on your ballot in May that would take away your right to vote for judges. So I ask you to stay engaged and knowledgeable and involved um, so that you're able to not remain silent in the face of these challenges. So I'm going to leave you with the words of one of my heroes and idols, that's Bernice Reagan. You know, during the Civil Rights Movement, she was in jail for a couple of weeks. Um, and out of that experience and, and the music that they used in um, jail to keep them going, she created the Sweet Honey and the Rock group. But early on, um, she talked about what the Civil Rights Movement meant to her, and these are her words. What I've had since the Civil Rights Movement is better knowledge of who I am in this society and the understanding of my power as a person to stand and speak and act on any issue that I feel applies to me in some way and therefore to other people. I learned that I did have a life to give for what I believed. Lots of people don't know that. They feel they don't have anything. When you understand that you do have a life, you do have a body, and you can put that on the line, it gives you a sense of power. So I was empowered by the Civil Rights Movement. I think we can all learn from Bernice Reagan's example. So we too must understand and know our power. Silence is not an option. We must stand and speak and act and vote on the issues that apply to us because all of our voices matter. Thank you. Even Presbyterians ought to say amen on that.